So I'm joined today with Amy Ellingworth, and she is the Assistant Superintendent Educational Services at Encinitas Union School District in California, and she's also an author. So I'm going to, Amy, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Happy so to be here. I, I want to start. What What are you most passionate about? <laughs> Great question. I am passionate about all things learning and especially instructional coaching, hence my book. That That is definitely a passion that drives everything I do. I take on my coaching hat in every role I take on. All right. So let's look at that in the coaching. Where At what level are you talking about coaching school leaders, coaching teachers, all of, all of the above? All the above. Yes, I have. I started out after being a teacher. I was an instructional coach myself. And so I was a coach of other teachers when I was a teacher. And then when I became an administrator, I kept that role of coach on. It was, it was an interesting role to be a new vice principal or a new principal and have teachers not understand that I was trying to be a coach in part of my role, not at, just an administrator, not somebody who was evaluating, but to truly be a side-by-side -side coach. And so I really modeled my administrative roles after that ever since. And I became a director who oversaw coaches at school sites. And now as an assistant soup, I, I believe I am coaching school leaders and I'm also coaching coaches who coach our teachers. Okay. So let's break that, that down a little bit. So the difference that you, it sounds like you, you separate the two between being an administrator and being a coach. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What are those differences? Well, I separate it because I think people don't recognize that an administrator can be a coach. And so it's really important for me to help distinguish. Administrators do wear other hats. We do have to be the evaluators. We do have to have difficult conversations, but we also are coaches. And because my passion is instructional coaching, I want to make sure that every conversation I have with teachers, with my colleagues, with my peers, that we are talking about the best outcomes for student learning. And the best way to get better is by coaching. We, you know, I've had a coach in so many aspects of my life life. And I think we're all better for having coaches. So I, I want people to not see the negative side of administration. I, I'm an administrator and I'm proud to be, and I love it, but some people take that with a grain of salt or there's an edge to that. So I want to make sure coaching is seen positively, no matter what my actual job title is. Okay. So it, in our audience, we always say it's a mixture of like three different groups of people. So there's a group of school leaders and that's our affiliation with this education leaders organization or ELO. Um, where it's this confidential peer network for school leaders. And coaching is an aspect that I feel like sometimes they feel like that they're not doing as much as they would want to. So what what are those aspects that you think make a good coach? Well, I think number one, being a good listener. I think that I, in my best coaching conversations, I actually do the least amount of talking and the person I am coaching does the most amount of co talking because my goal is to ask those reflective questions and to just keep the person reflecting and thinking and getting to a different place in their own journey. Because I could come in and tell you how to do something differently, but that may not be the best solution for you. It may not fit with your personality or your leadership style. But if in a conversation, you come to a new awareness of them, something you could try, that feels comfortable to you, then I feel like I've coached you into a new idea on your own. And that that's always my goal. So I think being a good listener is essential as a coach. And are, are there certain techniques that you're doing or certain questions that you're going through? And, and I'm asking this because I literally like in front of me, I always have this printed out right here. It's like the seven coaching questions. Oh, I love it. And, and it, and it prompts me and, and, you know, I don't always look at it because a lot of it is like, you're talking about listening and just trying to engage versus kind of sounding more scripted. Right. But, it, but is, is there some structure to it that there are, there is, it's funny. I have an entire chapter in my book on the types of questions to ask because I get asked that question a lot. And part of it, I do think having a few set questions in front of you helps you feel more comfortable as you're building your repertoire. And then it becomes more natural the more you are coaching. But one of the biggest pieces of advice I give, especially to our principals now, if you start a question with how, it's automatically going to be more open-ended. And the other piece that I recommend for people is making it, uh, po assuming positive intent, presuming positive intent. And so if I say, how are you ensuring all students uh, have opportunities to share their thoughts. I'm assuming you're doing that. I may not have seen it in my observation, but if I say, how are you doing that? I have presumed the positive intent that you are trying to get all students to share their thoughts. And I want you to share with me how. Now, if a teacher really quickly says to me, oh, I don't expect to hear from all students, then I know, okay, let's talk about that. What does that mean? But if you tell me ways that you've tried it and I just didn't happen to see it in an observation, then it's a great jumping off point for me to hear your perspectives, your instructional strategies, and for us to reflect on why that might've been missing in a lesson I happened to observe that day or that week. 
So is the coaching typically around observational or does it spread beyond, and then there's a reason I'm asking, does it spread beyond kind of more the tactical and, and the work thing? Does it go be more towards like what we talk about a lot of time, just like the full self dealing with mental health and Oh, and absolutely. Like yes. I've relied heavily on Elena Aguilar and all her research on coaching and all of her blog, her blogs and books from the art of coaching to the art of coaching teams to coaching for equity. And I, I believe that you are coaching, whether you're talking directly about a specific observation or whether a teacher or, or a colleague comes into your room sobbing and just need to need to feel supported and you need to have empathy for them. I believe we are coaching when we're in grade level PLC meetings or department meetings. You can be a coach in a staff meeting, depending on the questions you're asking and the ways you lead people to reflect and to, to think differently about their practices. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move into our second group of people that we, okay. we have a lot of listeners that come from the architect and design side of education. So they're the ones that are building new schools, renovating schools, and really looking at like how the spaces impact the pedagogy and the, the engagement and ultimately the outcomes of, of what we're doing mm -hmm. in, in education how, how much do you, you get involved with that on the coaching side of things of how to utilize the space? Because that's typically in our conversations, it feels like it's it becomes a lot of the disconnect where mm -hmm. the spaces are designed with an intent, the training and the support for the teachers and the educators using the space don't always get that. So it, does that come up at all? It does. Absolutely. And it's fine. I'm reflecting. I recently listened to one of your episodes where you interviewed my colleagues right down the road from Del Mar. They literally are mm -hmm. in the next district down. And I loved hearing them describe the journey they've taken on their learning spaces. We are in a different place at Encinitas. But um, because I'm in classrooms with teachers or I'm supporting principals with that, it comes up regularly in conversations. We have flexible seating and opportunities here in our district, but it was rolled out in such a different way that it still becomes an ongoing conversation. I think one of the things that makes us unique we are a green school district. We are a national green ribbon school, so to speak. We are very um, committed to our environmental sustainability. And so actually learning spaces and the architecture comes up more in our green conversations, especially because we want to make sure we're using outdoor learning spaces and place-based learning spaces. So it's less about the, the actual four walls or the furniture and more about all the different areas of a school community where you can learn and what does outdoor learning look like and how does environmental sustainability sustainability play a role in where we're doing that learning and what we're learning about. Yeah. Cause I would think that's very different. Um, because if you take, you know, for example, you take a teacher takes their classroom outside, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of different dynamics that, that get introduced to that good and bad. Right. So yeah. And there's a there... difference if you just, if you could take out whiteboards or books and iPads and sit outside and you're really just teaching outside. And right. so that's not the kind of outside learning that we're talking about. It's actually, how do you leave behind the traditional classroom materials and what materials would be necessary for the outside learning? And so part of it is exploration. Part of it is freedom to ask students brainstorming questions and going out and seeking answers to their questions. We try to connect a lot of our science lessons outdoors and we have the incredible opportunity to have our own district organic far, a certified organic farm on our in our school grounds and every child gets to visit that and have a place-based learning experience on the farm and so everything they do there is completely different than what you would do in a traditional classroom so we're modeling those practices of place-based learning in a different environment for all students and staff yeah that's really cool do you, i mean are you seeing like is it difficult for a teacher to do that does some do it better than others and you know yes and, and, and part of it like? yeah part of it is just experience obviously right and part of it is feeling comfortable enough in both a content that could translate outside and the management of what children's behavior looks like outside versus inside. We often have a very tight control on noise levels or behaviors in a classroom and everything feels louder and different and more chaotic when you go outside. So you have to be open to that chaos and the joy of what learning sounds like outside and then recognize which contents translate well outside and which ones do not. Like, yes, you could read under a tree and it's peaceful and wonderful, but there's also some specific learning opportunities that are better done outside and some that you absolutely need paper and pencil or technology inside of a, a four walled space. What are kind of like the most common things that are typically coming up in coaching sessions? 
I think that, um, you know, I think there's always, there's a, there's a range, of course, just like there are a range of teachers. I think when you're working with new teachers, classroom management is usually one of the first things that you tend to address. And then it's being comfortable with whatever the curriculum materials are, the standards, really making sure you understand what you should be teaching and then the how of teaching it. And then recognizing when challenges come up, how do you react? How do you work with your, your teams? I think when we have teachers pass that initial new year stage, often what our leaders and our teachers are, are challenged with is honestly more, more relational. And it's both the kid relationship in the classroom, kid to kid. It's the kid to teacher relationship. And then it's the teacher to teacher relationship and how we're working with our peers, how we're collaborating, how we're how we're sharing assessment data, how much trust do we have to be able to have the hard conversations about this lesson bombed in my classroom and I need help versus my kids aren't succeeding in this area of math and I'm, I'm seeking help. Often asking for that help is really hard for many of us. We're used to being isolated operators. And so to open up our doors and our practices and to ask for help is often a place where we do a lot of coaching just to, to build those relationships. So how formalized is like the coaching process? Like, is it like formally assigned and like a cadence to how often you meet with them? Like, what does that look like in your experience? Not in our, not in our system. I have been in systems where it was much more formal. And I will say that when a system mandates coaching, it's never going to go well. So it has to be more organic. It has to be when people request it and when they see the need for it. And part of it is educating people. If you've never worked with a coach as an educator, you don't necessarily, you think they're coming in to evaluate you or you don't know what it's for. And so having to build the understanding in the system of what coaching is for and how it can benefit all of us and then have trust coaches have to build that trust and they have to, build that relational capital and prove that they have something worthy of offering. So, you know, in our system, we have coaches on site to support teachers and they, it's been a brand new position over the last two years. So we've really built up what is the position, making sure people know and all the different ways coaching looks very different and it's more informal. It's, it's on a case by case basis. Some of the ways that it's more formalized is in our data collection process. These coaches lead the data collection and the data discussions. So we've made that part of the requirements of our system, and then some peer coaching, some observations, some demo lessons. Those are all the additional things you can kind of sign up for with a coach as you trust them. And then with with, with me coaching principals, the, my principals know that I am out at their schools every week doing classroom visits with them and coaching them. And then they can seek out additional resources or support from me as needed. And because I've now built a relationship with them, they'll call me when they're about to have a hard conversation and they want to be coached through the practice run or they want to role play before they they go into a conversation that's new to them. Or I had one coach, who, one principal who said, can you just write down five questions to give me to be ready to go? Just like you said, before I get into these conversations, what are the questions I should have on a post-it to be ready for at any point in time? So we have a lot of those conversations as they come up. So if I'm hearing right, is it kind of like opt-in for coaching or, or is it something that is kind of like everyone's expected to meet with a coach and in my current system it's a little of both and again i what we because we have this coach our, our coaches are called mtss tosas teachers on special assignment and mtss is that multi-tiered systems of support so that's our 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 way to help make sure our first instruction and our interventions are really we're really trying to create a cohesive system which is new so we have an mtss person at every single school site that that's not optional that's mandatory we're paying for it you get one and the four four days a year where teachers come together as a grade level team and meet with that person and their principal to look at student data is also not optional. Those are mandatory requirements. But then the additional supports and resources that coaches can offer is kind of an opt-in or a suggestion based on what the data is telling us or what the teacher needs are. So it then becomes very case by case where one teacher, one TOSA may be providing small group instruction support in one grade level. They may be pushing in and doing demonstration lessons in another grade level, and they may be helping to do some assessments and look at that data more strategically with a different grade level. And that's all based on the teachers opting in, but it's really based on the needs that they're wanting help with. Yeah. And, and with like our ELO group, so there, there's mm -hmm. some different components that we, that we do um, in ours. We, we have small groups we call forums, and these are just like these confidential peer groups of their, their peers around the country and it's purposely made where they're spread out around the country so that they can truly have this confidential area where they can kind of explore all aspects of their life and try to look at where what are they struggling with and get other people's experiences but the core tenant is that it's experience sharing versus advice giving 
So I'm curious, like from your perspective on the coaching side, like how much is like, is there accountability to it? Is it more like mentorship? Like how, like what does that process look like and where have you seen kind of be most successful? Right. Yeah. And I, I think that the most successful is when you have flexibility in the structures, because not one of those is going to work all the time. When I see groups that are more the experience sharing, I love to, to coach in with protocols. So they're, they, and I, like when you first described that, of course, now I'm not going to think of the name that I want to think of right now, uh, you know, having people have an opportunity to share their experiences in a protocol format where they can get feedback if they want, or whether it's just a listening kind of a protocol. We, I do find those, those are really helpful to help give a structure. Um, I think that when something is so open-ended that it becomes very loose, then it's not as, as effective either. So, you know, protocols just help us know who's going to talk when and what are we going to share about? And it helps me feel safe that this is the amount of data that I'm going to share, or this is how much people are going to ask me questions or give me advice or not, you know, different protocols ask for different things. So I do find that structures are important, but I think flexibility to choose the structure that works best for the, the time and the opportunity matters. So again, I, I'm currently in a system where everything there's most everything is optional or there's a lot of opt-in based on your choice. And so we're trying to really coach into what the needs are, where there are supports available to help you with those needs. Okay. So I guess that kind of leads into then the accountability. If it's optional, it, like does a person being coach have any accountability to their coach? Like mm -hmm. are they required to like, like is it part of it to like make commitments to that? Or is that, is that kind of not the intent. I, I think, I think in an informal way, yes, absolutely. And I think part of that becomes, you know, when I, when I was a coach myself, or when I engage in a very structured coaching cycle, where we're really working on a goal for a while, you and I would both, you would know that we're in a coaching cycle. I wouldn't be doing that without you being aware of it. So, so once you, once we're committed and we know what, like, if you're my teacher and I'm a coach and you, you want to work on a specific goal and we're in a coaching cycle, then we're going to be very explicit about what we agree with each other. Like, where do you want support? What's my role going to be? What's your role going to be? And and we are going to have accountability in the form of either regular observations or feedback or meetings or debriefs or whatever that looks like so that we can we can progress monitor to see if we're meeting the goal that we set out. Your goal being, you know, improving something in your instruction, my goal helping you do that or reflecting. So absolutely, there's accountability in that. But in most systems I see, it's based on the relationship between you and I, between the coach and the coachee. Um, I have seen places where they have very formal forms you have to fill out and structures and most places where I've been, the more paperwork somebody has to do, the less they want to do the thing that, that, that is really right. the meat of the work, right? Right. So yeah. accountability is a relative term. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like, a, um, at least in your district, there's a commitment where there's full-time coaches. Is there, is there also where it's like they're doing multiple roles, roles they're coaching on the side, or is it strictly like you, it, your well, role as a coach? It is a full-time person at every school, but the, the, because it's an MTSS TOSA, we didn't design it just as coaching. Coaching is a piece of their role for sure. Okay. And we, you know, luckily that this is how we chose to use some COVID one-time funds that we got in California, that we've been able to find enough funds to keep it going for a number of years to build a cohesive system. That's where we're in the middle of that build out right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've already kind of ventured into the third area here where I just call them the change makers. Like mm -hmm. the, these are the people that are driving change or looking at just ways to improve the system. And it doesn't matter what their title is, what, you know, what their role is. They can be in the industry, out of the, like, you know, like in the schools or out of the schools. Um, but, but they have some kind of passion or desire to, to drive that change. From your perspective, like how, how important is coaching in the big scheme of things of looking at, at, you know, like the state of education right now? Uh, well, in, in terms of the state of education, I think it's very important because I think that so so often as educators, as I mentioned earlier, we're these independent operators. We go in our classrooms, we close the door, or if I'm the principal, I'm the lone person on my campus doing that job. I go in my office, I close the door, and then I have nobody to bounce ideas off of. I have no one else to ask for advice necessarily, or I'm doing something and I have no idea if the classroom next to me or the principal down the road has better ideas or ideas that could better meet the needs of the students or staff I'm serving. So I think coaching helps bridge the gap 
up where none of us have enough time to read all the things that are out there or listen to every podcast in the world or just learn every new thing that exists. And coaches can help you that bridge. Not that coaches know everything either, but we sometimes have enough time built into our job to be the resource gatherer and share the information or to make the connections. I, you know, the, the joy of being an assistant superintendent is I work with all of our principals and I can make connections if they don't realize, hey, person A and person B are both working on this right now. Um, and I, so I think that's where coaching can be valuable. I think when you think about the, the change makers, as you were saying, I think oftentimes we, a coach or a principal is often the person who's going to find those change makers because they're going to bubble up naturally in a system. And so when you learn about them, again, a coach or a principal could be somebody who is sharing the work that somebody's doing over there and helping light a fire under an idea that you want to grow. And, you know, I, right now the science of reading is something that we are digging into deeper and we have some significant change makers who came to us first and said hey red flag it's time to look at this and our resources aren't matching what we know is true for kids so we have to relook at a system and that was really a grassroots effort in our system that's come up and we're making shifts based on those original change makers yeah yeah obviously that podcast series of soul is a story i feel like is is oh, really yes. making its way through through schools around the country and yeah and it, it's good so uh, as much if to the audience if you have not listened to that go listen to it and and um and look at that because you know to your point it is it's like if we kind of stay in our own silos and and don't see what's going on in, in the places you can miss out on opportunities to, to learn and grow mm -hmm. um all right so that's kind of my as if we're getting close to wrapping up my question to you then is as an assistant superintendent who are your resources? What are the places that you're looking to kind of around you so that you continue to, to grow and, and kind of be the best version of yourself for the people that you serve? Right. Yeah. So, so people that I look to personally are previous bosses, previous mentors who have done, and then people who are in my same or similar role who are doing the same work so that we can have those conversations. And then I do li listen to podcasts. I am an avid reader. Anyone who follows my blog knows I blog every month about what I read and I read, you know, 10 to 15 books a month, professional books built into that as well. So I am constantly seeking information through a lot of sources, both the, the reading of books, journals, magazine articles, as well as um, social media media. I use social media. I, I've been on Twitter for a million years and for all the good and bad of all the social media that's out there, one of the first benefits that I found to Twitter was connecting me with other, other educators around the world doing similar things to me and vastly different things to me, which was able to expose me. It's a, It was just a quick way to get into other people's classrooms or schools without leaving my own building was to be able to see through Twitter, through Twitter chats and connect with other professionals. So, so those are a lot of the ways that I seek out other learning and, and coaching and mentoring for myself. Yeah. Well, good. Well, good. Well, I appreciate what you're doing and joining. Anything I didn't ask you that I should be asking you about? Um, I, you know, I think one of the original reasons we connected is because I wrote a book. I mean, I wrote an article about blogging. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's another thing that I do. I, I reflect by writing. Writing is one of my other passions. And so I reflect in writing. And so writing my blog monthly leads to often writing articles or my book or other things like that. And I do encourage other leaders to write, whether you choose to make it public or not is always your choice. But the reason I choose to make my blog published publicly um, <laughs> is to put those ideas out there and to share both the challenges and the successes, the struggles and the realities of where we are because other people will connect. And I will write, often write a blog just about a random thing I'm trying or something that didn't go well. And I get more feedback on those posts and other things because people are saying, hey, I wanted to try that or I have tried that and I failed too or I had success here. And again, it's just sharing our story. Telling our story is the best way to make those connections. And so I do find that writing, sharing those blogs, blogging feels very old school in some ways, but I encourage people to still, there's still blogs out there and there's great resources being shared and just reflections out there. Yeah. Well, that's a great point. We always talk about too. It's how like everyone learns different ways. Some, you know, like learn on their own or in group work or by teaching others. And that's kind of been my thing too, is like even this podcast becomes that way for me to learn and interact with others to do it that way. Um, so it, it's a great point of just like finding that outlet um, of what is that, what is that thing that kind of helps you grow, process, self-reflect and, and, be able to do that and yeah to your point sometimes it's writing sometimes it's something else in it but it is so important that everyone kind of finds their their outlet for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I love my colleagues in my own current school district, but I also really benefit from talking to somebody who knows nothing about my system and just somebody in another role in another place, just to be able to bounce ideas off each other with a very different perspective. That's just as important as sitting with my boss or my colleagues in my office and brainstorming the specificity of our jobs today. 
Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with one last question because we were at AASA in San Antonio um, asking school leaders this. Uh, what's the thing that's keeping you up at night? <laughs> There's a lot of things keeping me up at night. I think I, you know, student learning is always my my number one question, concern, success, challenge in life. So for the students who we aren't yet meeting their needs, that is always something that's concerning to me. And I say yet because I know that we're going to get there, but there are some system changes we need to make, some content changes we need to make to meet everyone's needs. We're not there yet. Um, and then the science of reading has really been one of the things that we've been digging into much deeper here because we are a very creative, innovative district, and I don't want to lose that innovation in the service of finding some different ways to to address the science of reading, especially the phonics instruction in K-1-2. So I'm, I right now, my big challenge in my brain is how do we celebrate and continue the successes of innovation and, and having people have their own agency in their classrooms while honoring that we need some more consistency and some more structure in this specific area right now? Well, good. Well, to the listeners, if uh, we'll have links to to Amy's information, in her book, and in, in the notes. But if you're not a subscriber to this, just subscribe wherever you're listening to this too. And if you go to BetterLearningPodcast.com, we have a survey that's on there. It takes a couple minutes to go through, and the show is all about kind of connecting and breaking down silos to with the goal of improving education. And we have some things in there where if you just take a quick survey, we have some kind of suggestions to try to get some alignment on, on different ways that we could provide resources or uh, or just kind of align your interests and your gifts with with ways that, that can help. So Amy, really appreciate your time. Thank Great you so much for you. having me. Great to talk to you too. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.